Good evening. Welcome to another Folk Tuesday Folk People session in our series. Um, tonight we offer you two very different performers who encompass opposite sides of the folk world. First, we welcome an artist who's been honing his craft since childhood, having huge successes in the Scottish fiddle competition scene. With his beautiful northeast fiddle style, we're delighted to welcome to home stage George Davidson. And to spoil you even more, for the second half of this evening, we're delighted to welcome fantastic singer-songwriter Mark Fawcett. You may not realise, but Mark has been to every Tuesday Folk People session we've hosted so far as Homestage's very own sound engineer. But tonight he's stepping from behind the scenes to treat us to an insight into his life as a singer-songwriter and musician. So I'd like to welcome our two guests now. Hello. Hi. I can't see anything. Oh, no. Um, well, Hopefully that can be sure sorted. I can't see anything. Um, I'm hearing well, something actually, actually at the moment. <laughs> yeah, I think it's a bit temporary. We'll fix that now. But while we're waiting, I'll just give George a little introduction because he's who we're going to be talking to first, hopefully, um, if his sound gets fixed. Um, so we're going to begin by interviewing Tarvis based George Davison, exploring his incredible award winning musical career and unique Scottish fiddle style. Um, to begin with, I do think it would be a great idea to hear some of his music. Um, we're going to be playing a march called Pipe Major George Mitchell, followed by a Strass Bay called Robert Davidson of Tilly Hilt and finishing off with a reel called the Tarvis Rant. Um, hopefully if we can get George back, we can afterwards hear a little bit about it. But for now, here's the music. Thank you. 
Oh, God, can you hear us now, much. George? Yes, I can hear you. Yeah. <laughs> okay, good. That was worrying. Technology. And I'm absolutely yeah, clueless, right. so I didn't know any way how I could get you back. But luckily, we've got yeah. we've got people got to help us. Yes, back. Thank, thank goodness. Thank goodness. Um, George, could you tell us a yes. little bit about the tunes that we've just heard? Yeah, so the tunes I just heard um, was a uh, traditional Northeast March to Real uh, written by myself, so I wrote all three tunes. Um, the first one, the march, was a pipe march, so it was the a pipe march is um, intended to imitate the bagpipes, hence you've probably heard all the ornamentation and stuff in the march. Um, it's called Pipe Major George Mitchell. Now, George Mitchell was, or is, my uh, granddad. Um, he wasn't actually a pipe major, he just played pipes for fun, but I thought it would be funny to call it Pipe Major George Mitchell. Um, it's just a, it's written for my dad, it's called Robert Davidson of Tilly Hilt. Um, Tilly Hilt is the, the family house where my mum and dad still stay. Um, my granddad, he built that house um, a way back. And the reel is just a reel that I had sitting for a long time without a name. Um, I just decided to call it the Tarvis Rant. Uh, the Tarvis Rant is a small day-long festival of uh, traditional music and song held in Tarvis, which is where I'm from in Aberdeenshire. So. Wow. Wait, you, you mentioned that you're, um, you wrote one of the, the tunes for your granddad. Um, yes. It, is that, you're obviously from a, a musical family then. Well, I wouldn't say that that's uh, my granddad. He, he played the pipes a little bit. He, he wasn't great. Um, if he's watching, I'm sorry, granddad. But he, he wasn't an amazing bagpiper. He did it for fun. Um, but uh, my granny and granddad, they are definitely musical. You had them on the show um, not too long ago. And they, that's probably where uh, all the musical encouragement in my family, um, very encouraging grandparents, you know, they... They uh, encourage both me and my brother. My brother plays a fiddle too. Um, both of us from a young age um, to uh, play and speak in front of audiences um, and just grow in confidence um, from a young age up until, well, I can't say young age, so I'm only 24, but all the way from sort of 12 years old right the way up to now. Um, very encouraging. Uh, Dad, Dad doesn't play any instruments, but he's got a very musical ear. Um, so I would probably say that the, the musical ear comes from him. Um, and my mum, she she doesn't play anything, but she she enjoys the music. She appreciates it too. So, uh, I'm a mildly musical family, I'd say. Yeah. Fab. I think that we're gonna go just quickly to our next song. Okay. Um, this is a waltz and a jig. The waltz is called Janie's Waltz, I believe, and the jig is called the Forgotten Fiddler. Have I got that right? Yes. Yeah. Right. Fab. Well, we'll go in to listen to that now. Cool.
Thank you. <laughs> Could you tell us a bit about the tunes you just played then? Yeah, so the first one um, was the same story again. I had a tune for ages sitting with no name. It was a waltz I'd written that came to my mind. Um, and then I have a friend from Shetland. Um, it was her birthday, I think it was mid last year, and I totally panicked. I hadn't got her present, so I gave her that tune, basically. Um, <laughs> she, was, she was happy with it. And then the jig, uh, another story, I, I, I keep writing tunes that, that, and just leaving them nameless. This one was... Uh, um, for, I dedicated it to my pupil, Erin, um, a teacher that I've been teaching her for three, four years now. Um, again, during the lockdown, I um, completely forgot about her lesson twice in a row. So I, um, named, I, I named the tune Forgotten Fiddler after her. Um, so she, she, she appreciated the funny side. She thought it was quite funny. So I think I think anyone would. And I'd love to get a tune as a gift. Because obviously yeah. that takes so much time and effort to make. Um, I would like to now talk a little bit about your fiddle style. We mentioned it before when we had our little conversation. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And it's it's the Northeast fiddle style, isn't it? Could you yeah, tell yeah. us a bit about that? Okay, so Northeast is always in Northeast of Scotland, Aberdeenshire, um, mainly to be precise. Um, the, I mean, the style goes way, way back, um, you know, obviously way before my time. Um, some, some famous names from here is James Scott Skinner, William Marshall, Peter Milne. These are all very famous um, fiddle players and composers from the Northeast. Um, and, and some other tunes are uh, played worldwide, you know, all over the world, their tunes are known. Um, but in terms of the style, I th I'd say the Northeast style is particularly known um, for, for the way that we play stressed bays. Um, they've got a very bold and rich tone to them. And there's a lot of specific bowing techniques we use, um, some of which the updriven bow is one that we use quite a lot um, in Strasbe playing here. Um, but across the board, there's not, there's not only just the one northeast style um, in Scotland, there's styles from all over Scotland. Um, you know, even if you just go to the other side of the country, you've got the west coast and then you've got the highlands and then you've got some near the borders as well. They've got a completely different style too. So um, I think, you know, even within styles themselves, you'll have people that prefer to play things slightly differently. So, you know, if I, if I my, my teacher, Paul Anderson, if he, you know, uh, towards the end of my lessons with him, if he was, you know, teaching me something um, and I would, you know, nod my head in the lesson, but I would then go away and say, oh, I'd actually, you know, I'd rather play it this way because I think it sounds better. That's just a development of style. Um, so nor predominantly northeast, but I'd probably say I have a little bit of my own own take on on a lot of the tunes that I play. Um, but yeah, so I, that's that's the style that I predominantly play in. I watch this being real as a pretty bog standard northeast style um, of set, as well as other styles too, but particularly northeast. It's fascinating, and it's it's so similar. From what I can tell, it's quite similar in the tone and everything to classical music, and it. Is that right that it is? Yeah, because you, yeah, you were well, originally well, yeah, yeah. classical, you were originally classical well, violinist, I, when, weren't when you? I first, yeah, when I first started learning when I was nine, um, it was obviously you, you learn, you have to learn the classical violin because it's the complete basics and fundamentals of playing the, the violin or the fiddle, regardless of what you would call it, it's the, it's the fundamentals of, of the instrument. Um, so I wasn't really introduced to Scottish music until about four or five months after I started. Um, and obviously, I took the traditional Scottish music like a fish in water. I, I absolutely loved it from the word go. Um, but I, I was always told to continue my classical teachings because it can, it's all the basics and all the techniques. It's all the same. Um, you know, your third, your position work, um, your ornamentation, it's all it's pretty much the same as, as classic. Um, so I would say for any, any you know, young violin fiddle player, if they're doing a lot of traditional music, please keep up the classical music because it does contain all of the basics and the fundamentals and the techniques that you will use in the traditional music world as well. But then I've heard that often it's really difficult to change over from classical to folk. So this is really interesting that you're actually saying, try and use them as a blend because <laughs> that's quite often in my head seen as quite a divide. So it's quite nice to hear. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, the cl class going from classical. I mean, I, I can't talk from experience, um, but a good program to watch would be um, Nicola ben Benedetti and Ali Bain 
Um, they do a they do a program that was on TV a while ago. It's a bit of a crossover where Ali plays a lot of the classical stuff, no bother. But then and then he just cannot play Astro Space. He really, really struggles to get, you know, to capture the the characteristics of Astro Space. Um, I don't know whether it's because traditional music is so subjective and there's a lot of, you know, pretty much off the books technique, if you like, um, compared to classical. That it, it is. If you if you spent so long being a classical player and you're sticking by the book to suddenly go oh well you actually don't need to do that you can do whatever you want basically it, it can be pretty difficult I could imagine. Yeah, well I think um, well just just a quick background before we hear our next song. You were taught by someone who's considered to be I think I've written it down here um, the finest Scots fiddler of his generation. Um, that's Paul Anderson. Uh, I don't want to be too much of a shoot, but uh, yeah, Paul, he was—he was my teacher, Paul. Um, he's—he's—he's he's, he's pretty, pretty famous around these parts as Paul Anderson. Um, but yeah, no, he—he—he he, uh, he was my teacher from well, my original teacher moved to the states um, after two years, and then my dad was looking for another teacher and came across Paul Anderson. So he was—he uh, was probably my main influence to to my style today. Well, his, this next song that we've got that uh, you've sent in, Farewell to St Kilda, this was written by Paul, wasn't it? Yes, yeah, so it was yeah. written by Paul, yeah, yeah. Could you tell us a bit about the, the background behind why he wrote it and stuff, if you know? I, I mean, I, I can't talk for Paul, but I, I'm, I'm led to believe that he wrote this tune while he was on the boat leaving St Kilda. Uh, for those who don't know, St Kilda is an island off the west coast. Um, but um, as far as I'm aware, there's nobody who lived there. I think it was the early 1900s that the, the, the island was deemed inhab uh, uninhabitable because it was unsafe. Um, so if you can try and imagine, you know, somebody leaving on a boat and looking back and seeing the high cliffs and the seabirds, I think that's the the the, um, the atmosphere that Paul has tried to capture um, in this like, in this lawyer. Um, it's a very nice tune. I, I can't, can't say if I played it very well, but it's a very... <laughs> okay, well, let's have a listen. Let's see if Paul really did capture those cliffs and the beauty of St yeah, Kilda. Yeah.
so beautiful that one no i heard that one on youtube before and it's every time i hear it i must have listened to it about eight times it just it really i don't know you somehow capture the essence of scotland when you play it it's just so beautiful and yeah. we've got a lot of people here who are agreeing we've got annie brown says what a lovely pure sound pauline creswell said could listen to this for hours um steve evans says Interesting that like a ballroom dancer, George's arms and body are moving around, but his head is fixed on his instrument. <laughs> it is interesting. Yeah, um, suppose, yeah. And Helen Handcart, Helena Handcart, sorry, says, wonderful playing, but it's also touching that the tunes are composed with personal collections, connections to people in George's life. And she's obviously talking about the first two lots that we heard. Hmm. And it is, it's really beautiful. And you're giving me such an insight into sort of the Scottish tradition because I didn't know much about it and obviously how rich it is and how there's different parts. Mm -hmm. So thank you, George. Yeah. No, you're very, very, very um, welcome. <laughs> I think for this next bit, we could perhaps talk about your life on the uh, fiddle competition scene because that's quite, oh, okay. that's been quite prominent, hasn't it? it so has, could you yeah, tell yeah. us like how you got into that? How did I get into that? Well, my first teacher, um, Judy Nixon, um, she sort of introduced me to the competition scene. I, think, I can't remember when my first competition was. I think I might have been 10 or 11. Um, and, you know, introduced me. Um, and I, I played, she, she gave me quite a lot of tunes um, that I'd never heard because obviously I hadn't really played traditional music that long. Um, and, you know, I, I struggled to play some of them and I think I, I think I got put off a little bit. Um, but when I went, started going to Paul, um, and he said, you know, I have to play really difficult tunes, you know, just play tunes that you're comfortable playing. I think I then sort of started to find my feet and started to enjoy the competition scene. Um, and I was competing in competitions all over Scotland, um, for which I have to really thank my dad because he took me to every single competition in the car. Um, so and I never asked for any payment in return. So if you're watching, dad, thanks very much. Um, but I competed right the way through from 12, right until probably two, three years ago um all the way up through the junior ranks and into the senior ranks and um i, I was i was successful um in, in a few of them um and the, i think the, the the ultimate aim of the, the glen fiddle fiddle championship that was the i went to that you got to be 18 to be invited to that so i went to that when i was about 13 14 just to watch with my dad and i was watching thinking wow the standard here is absolutely amazing you know i i could only ever dream of, of entering that competition um and, you know, I worked really, really hard. I practiced a lot and did a lot of competitions all over. Um, and then when I turned 18, I did, I got invited to uh, the Glen Fiddick and I was very fortunate to be placed second um, on the first attempt. And then I got re-invited the year after in 2015 and I was fortunate enough to win it. So um, that's, uh, that's probably my, my career highlight in terms of competitions, winning that competition. And they sadly, they stopped doing it after I won it. They pulled the funding, which is a real shame. Um, but I was just glad to, to, to be able to win that competition mm -hmm. before they stopped it. So You never know. Maybe it's because they knew they couldn't top you, so they had to stop. Nah, well, I, I, <laughs> couldn't I, keep I having you winning ever, it every year. I, I would <laughs> never say that about myself. No way. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay, I'll say it for you. Um, but am I right in saying that the, the Glen Fiddick Fiddle Championships is like the most prestigious championships in Scotland? Yeah, so for 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 a competition for the Glen Fiddick was the you know the cherry on top. That that was the one that you would aim for. Um, it's great for young kids to go to and see that for for a young comp a competing fiddler, that was the competition that you would you know you would try and set your sights on. Um, and you know there's there's some people say that it's the most prestigious Scots fiddle competition in the world. I would definitely not say that because you know <laughs> it's it's just a competition in Scotland. But um, there is some real top top fiddlers have been to that competition. Paul, Paul Anderson, he's won that competition back in 19 something. I don't want to show his age, but um, no, that, that is, that's, that's the one you would aim for. Any competing fiddler, um, that, that's the, the top competition. So I was even to be invited, it was an absolute honor, but to win it was obviously, you know, career highlight by far. And you're now a teacher sort of training your own student yes. to get there maybe yeah, one day yeah i've just got the one private people at the moment obviously because i've I'm a, I've got a full-time job i just do it on the side and um, i've got erin she's watching so if you're watching hello erin she's um <laughs> i have never ever met somebody that practices so hard in my life you know she's an absolute <laughs> joy to teach 
it's, it just makes me want to continue teaching and you know get more pupils just because of how good a pupil she is because i mean I, i've i've been in group lessons when i was a kid and you get some absolute horror pupils so you know, to have such a good pupil was was, was is uh, it just makes me you know enjoy teaching so much and um, mm. i also teach i have taught through uh, there's a there's a um uh what's what's the word uh, a group called scottish culture and traditions in aberdeenshire they put on lessons for for adults um on, on all instruments of all levels so i teach the advanced fiddle class through them although i haven't because of the lockdown but before that i was teaching the advanced fiddle class through them so i had about 14 or 15 adults i was teaching um in group lessons too so that was a good laugh um, so yeah, I do a bit of teaching on, on the side of my full-time job, so it's good fun. Is that where you sort of see your um, career going or do you want to go back into performing once COVID's over? Uh, once once all this stuff is over, it would be really nice to, you know, to start performing again. So I, I, I continue to, you know, practice and have a bit of a boot up the behind really to, to keep to a certain level that I'm happy with, because I am by far my own worst critic. So, I mean, the, the, the performances you heard tonight was, was um I, I i would you know i was happy with them i wouldn't say i was you know absolutely delighted um but having not touched the fiddle really for a year um i think i think i did okay but in terms of career wise i've always said to myself that i would rather you know my music was a hobby so i can always enjoy it and not have to rely on it for a source of income etc so yeah. i think how i've got it now i'm, I'm an electrician full time and having my music as a hobby is probably how i will keep it in the future as long as you keep playing, you have to promise us oh, that. Oh yeah, yeah. So I don't good. ever, won't ever stop playing. No. Good. Well, we're actually sadly running out of time now. So, mm. before we hear your last song, um, I'd just like to read just a couple more comments. Okay. Um, Callum Kelman says, "A wonderful insight into the Scottish fiddle scene. Some excellent <laughs> pieces." Um, Tony Purdy says, "Seamless between each piece." So if you think you're your own worst critic, well, you should take these on board. <laughs> yeah. um, so we're going to finish with some jigs. Um, and they're called The Favourite Dram, Miss Anne Cameron of Balvenie. Is that right? Yeah, Balvenie, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you. And A Sailor's <laughs> Wife. Um, yeah. Just can you tell us just a little bit about them before we hear them? And um, well, the first two, the first two um, is part of a set that I first heard on one of Paul Anderson's CDs. I just thought that there were two. They're, they're jigs and nine eight, so you count in three instead of two. Um, which just they're, they're nicknamed slip jigs. Um, just two really really nice tunes. Really, and uh, the favourite drum especially is, is a great tune. Um, and then the last tune, a sailor's wife, is uh, is a tune I've known since I was a kid. It's just a really good going fun jig to play um it's in a it's in a minor key and it's just got a great sound to it so um that's why i've chosen those three fantastic let's hear them
thank you much. so much <laughs> for joining us, George. It's uh, been thank really, you for having really me. It's been so inspiring. And if I could play my violin with even a quarter of the skill that you can, I'd be over the moon. So thank you. Thank you very we much are... for having me. That's <laughs> all right. <laughs> um, we're now going to jump over to a completely different aspect of the folk scene um, with singer-songwriter Mark Fawcett. Um, just like with George, um, I think we should probably... Thank you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we should probably get started by hearing a little bit of Mark's music, sort of whet our appetites, know what we're going to be in for. Um, so could you tell us a little bit about your first song, Mark? I think it's called I Am Here. Oh, yeah, thanks. Um, so, wow, I'll tell you something about it. Um, I hope that the lyrics are pretty clear so you, you can hear them, as you know. Uh, but this this is a song for me. This is my, my next album when it comes out. Is, uh, it's going to be called On the Periphery and the um, On the Perimeter. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I was wondering about periphery, but I prefer on the perimeter. So, so that's a bit of a, a thought process there. Um, and it's the second line of this song, and it's it's about being on the sort of on the outskirts of a society, or on the outskirts of a, um, like a, a other people's world. Your and and but it's it's also it's not necessarily a question of you're not allowed in, although I think maybe that's what I was thinking about at the time. Um, but it's it's about maybe maybe going in as well. So okay, let's hear it. Very nice. That was Very really nice. nice. Thank you, Thank you, Mark. 
No, that's all right. It's funny it's, listening to it just then. I realised that you said, "What's it about?" What, you know, tell us something. And it's like I didn't really say it. I didn't really say what it was about at all, did I? And, and I think, I think very often when you when you write something, it it's about so much more than 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 something you can sum up. It's but I hope hopefully that comes across. Well, it's you know, it's you, always got different meanings for everyone listening to that because obviously that when you wrote it had a meaning for you didn't it but then maybe someone listening to that it takes on a completely different meaning so it is quite difficult to say exactly what you know what that is that is the dream is that someone claims ownership of your own your writing so when they listen to it they care you know they it means something to them where they own it as much as you own it you know yeah it's almost it it brings forth an idea that when you write a song it's almost a, your responsibility to share it because you don't know who it can help. Obviously, it's the artist's choice, but yeah. you don't know who's going to really take, um, like they're going to relate to what you've written, do you? So I'm glad you yeah. shared that with us. <laughs> well, it's, it's funny because I, I, my uh, my great friend and my guitar teacher when I was in my mid-teens, the onwards, he always said, you shouldn't be so arrogant to think that you're the, you'll be the only person who likes your music. <laughs> you know, somebody else <laughs> yeah. is going to do it too, you know. But then Annie DeFranco also said, I know you need your instrument, but does your instrument need to be mic'd? So there is always that question. <laughs> <laughs> so. I think, Mark, we should probably get a bit of background and sort of understand how you got into music because am I right in saying that you did a physics degree? I did, yeah. So you you weren't, or were you always a musician? But... I was, yeah, I was always a musician and I've always been a musician, you know, in my heart. I mean, I, I, I got into music when I was about nine. I live for it, live for it, music, you know, and it's, but, you know, when, you, when you, you're thinking about the future and thinking about education, you often, you maybe go for something a bit more, more stable. And the phrase, the phrase that I always learned was something to fall back on. But I made sure that my degree was, was, was such a bad class of degree that it was impossible to fall back on it. So, and, I, and I did that by drinking beer, writing songs and, and falling in love. So really, so, your university right was music. You did yeah, the physics, was. but it was, yeah. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. I think it's, yeah. it sounds a bit more romantic than my degree. <laughs> and, what, and your degree was in... It was music, but we didn't have the whole drinking beer, falling in love. <laughs> it it's was, a different era. It's a different era. Back in those days, I shouldn't say it, but the government paid us to do all those things. <laughs> so lucky. <laughs> I'm older. Jealous. <laughs> Very so much is jealous. that where your your songwriting started? Uh, yeah, pretty much. I mean, I, th- I wrote a song. Um, I would say I was writing from the moment that... I'd say about 11, I'd write, you know, just, just but I wouldn't be able to play the guitar and, and sing them because, uh, you know, but I would write tunes um, and words and um, and then, you know, and I, and I had a go, but it was, it, you're, it started properly when I was at university, definitely. When you sort yeah. of had that freedom for the first time, you can really yeah. let it all out, yeah. yeah. Well, I think, no, carry on, sorry. <laughs> Well, no, it's it, it's actually it was. I always think songwriting comes 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 to you when you've when you've got something desperately to say but you can't express it properly, uh, you know, in the real world. And so, um, so that's 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 when I started writing because, you know, the angst, the angst of not being <laughs> able to express it. So, yeah. Well, I think we should listen to another one of your songs. Um, this next one is called um, "You Can Be." Oh no, it's not. It's called. Another way. Sorry, oh, yeah. just getting them all mixed up. Um, yeah, before we hear it, do you want to again tell us what it's about, if you can? Well, I've got to be a bit careful about explaining what these songs are about. I realise, especially if, if maybe anyone who might even feature in them is watching or ever, sees this, <laughs> I wouldn't want to, to, to break a confidence. Um, this, I, I think, you know, I've, I've written a lot of songs which are a little bit maybe sad, you know, people, it sounds sad, sounds melancholic, bittersweet was, was the mm-hmm. phrase which was used to be used. And um so one of one of the things that that would be um as people would say oh can you do something more upbeat can you do something happier and sometimes that isn't the song that that you have to sing you know and i haven't really got you know so then that's that's quite a struggle for me to do a a sad a a really buoyant happy pop song really Mm -hmm. um and i was just about to go on stage and um somebody i was with at the time said to me you know play something play something upbeat you know to play a happier song and I was like but she didn't say those words but 
and I was crushed. I couldn't play. You know what I mean? I was absolutely crushed by it because I, I thought, well, I haven't got anything happy, have I? <laughs> As I can express with my face. <laughs> Carry on. Play it. Okay. <laughs> There's a time and a place for everything A cliche for every mistake But if you don't take it easy Your lonely heart might break well, She's got to go somewhere yeah, She's got to go somewhere And if she doesn't go my way She'll go Another way Well I've been meaning to return your cause But the days turn into weeks I've been meaning to say that I'm sorry For the hours that I keep I've been driving around the country So busy simple fact is it's over and it's time for the message boy to leave when she goes out in the sun she says why don't you come along and while you write it perhaps you can find it in yourself Sing a happy song And so do all the people we've got here. We've been having loads of comments coming through. Tony Purdy says, can't beat a sad song. Um, Eileen and Robert Blake say, loving this groove. Um, we've got um, Emily McKinney says, um, oh no, that's why working class people have no money to write songs now. <laughs> Not sure. <laughs> oh yeah, no, 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 that was, that, that was a criticism. <laughs> <laughs> Fair, fair point. Oh, well. <laughs> Something you said to me when we were having our chat uh, before this event um, was that you will uh, sort of write a song when you have this feeling of yearning or angst, as you said earlier. And I, I thought that was so relatable because it is, isn't it? It's that, that point at which you've got this emotion, you can't release it, and then and then you that's, that's the only way, is through the power of song. And I think you can, yeah. you can tell that through what you've your two, your last two songs. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Well, that leads also onto something because you said before that you you perform songs um, for you, not so much for for other people. 
yeah Could yeah I, I mean I, I do obviously like I was saying I mean I do I do hope that people can see something and you know that they can share in what what I'm doing but it's you know ultimately in that you know that moment when I'm writing the song it is completely about being uh honest and that's you know about myself really you know being honest to myself about you know the thing so if it if, it, if I can't square it with myself I, it's, it's it doesn't get into the song and um yeah, and, and it's that form of expression is something that I need to do, you know. And um, so, yeah, it, it's, it's, it, is, it is for me. So um, you sort of, you don't think about the audience when you're writing. You, you don't think, oh, really... this will be catchy. <laughs> I th do you know what? That feeling of, of making something that could be catchy or, or, or a sound of my voice mixing with the guitar, um that obviously is something i hunt for you know it's like and that makes me inspires me and makes me want to do more with with the song um and and i guess if i can hear it sounding a certain way then you know then i hope hope that other people will as well so it, it, it kind of does go hand in hand um but maybe maybe i guess it requires some some people to to to, to maybe get into where where my tonality is and if if they can if they can sort of enjoy that as well, then, you know, but that, that requires work on the listener, I suspect, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so then if, if that's the case, why do you perform it? Why don't you just sort of keep it for you? Well, that's a really, that is a really good question. Um, there is, there is a real magic about sharing, does it, does, you know, and the, the, the gift that an audience gives to you when they listen to you is I, I don't know maybe 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 I'm some kind of uh, you know I'm I'm contradicting myself here but it's it's a wonderful moment you know um, well hey I'm I suppose you're you've asked me a question and thank you everyone who's listening to me rambling on about an answer uh, <laughs> because that's exactly what it is it's um do you know when when the room goes silent and at the end of a song you know or or during a song even <laughs> you know it's it's a pretty magical experience because. I, although I do these things for myself, I am a human being and sharing and being listened to is absolutely is, is everything as well, because it's it's a connection, isn't it? And and yeah. we all want to be heard. We all want to be validated, really, not not validated for being great, but validated for being worthwhile listening, listen to. Do you know what I mean? Respected, I suppose. Uh, it's not that I demand respect. <laughs> you know, but I, hope, I hope it's clear what I'm trying to say, you know. Yeah. Yeah. With with that in mind, could you tell us about the next song we're going to hear? I think it's well, graffiti. Yeah, this 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 to me um, when I when I first um, when I was young and I just see graffiti, I didn't like it because I was out of and I felt like it was some kind of it was damage that was being done, and I I do think that sometimes graffiti is damage, but um, I think a lot of the time it is the expression of the artist. Um, they, tr they are you know, and it is their it's their thing that they do, and they 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 will go to some great risk to do that as well uh, in on lots of different levels and um so so this song to me is about um recognizing other people's form of self-expression and poetry you know the whatever that is for them but in this case it's graffiti but it, you know I, I invite people to think about other things as well like sort of yeah. taking yourself to that dangerous place and really making yourself vulnerable almost well, just, thank you. Yeah, that's stress. a lovely thing to say. Yeah. That, that, hmm. Okay. Shall we hear it? <laughs> Out from the dark came the mag light burning holes with intent dressed in fear and shining with gold gilt hunting down thrashing out protecting Property. Someone 
on his climbing bridges, leaving their mark. Climbing bridges and leaving their mark. Hiding in the shadows. Disappointed ones paint binding fingers tight until the battle is done. Dogs on the run, the dogs on the chase. Everything restricted. Forced into place. Someone is climbing bridges, leaving their mark. Climbing bridges and leaving their mark. Gazing from a train etched into your car, reflection on you, the real thing, living poetry, the real thing. Someone is climbing bridges, leaving their mark. Climbing bridges and leaving their mark. Someone is climbing bridges, leaving their mark. Climbing bridges and leaving their mark. I love them all. <laughs> Um, and we've had some more great comments. Irvin Munir says, excellent. Jeremy Harmer says, beautiful, Mark. Bev Praver, I think that's how you say it, says, great song, Mark. Marshlander du Marais says, oh, one of my favourites. And it turns out earlier wasn't a criticism. They were um, upset about the fact that we have to pay for education now, oh, <laughs> which I am you. also <laughs> upset about. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I appreciate them saying um, that. Thank you. Yeah. Well, you deserve it, Mark. Um, we've obviously talked about your songwriting, which is a major part of your musical career, but it's not the only part, is it? Because you're also in the Don't Fool the Horse, I think it's called, the Neil Young Tribute Band. Don't Spook the Horse. Oh, similar. Don't yeah. Spook the Horse. <laughs> yeah, the Don't so Fool close. the Horses, I don't know. Um, yeah, that's right, yeah, the Neil Young Tribute Band. <laughs> and why Neil Young? Whoa. Why not? Sing Joni Mitchell. Yeah, I couldn't sing Joni Mitchell songs, you know. <laughs> but um, yeah, no, I just I love Neil Young. Actually, my my guitar teacher when I was in the, my uh, Brian Ede, um when I was in my middle teens, um, he introduced me to Neil Young. Prior to that, I was into West Coast like Steely Dan and um, uh, sort of modern jazz like like Mike Stern, uh, guitar player. And then he he just said, "Don't play so lightly. Play like this." And um, literally, he said it like that. And uh, so he taught me, he taught me how to, you know, really 
go for it with the guitar and, and, and put some passion in, into music. And um, and he and I both, we, we put this band together, um, this Neil Young tribute band together because Neil Young plays with passion, you know, and um, so uh, so just love the music. And it was it was back in the day when, um, you know, this tribute bands first started emerging, but they were all quite commercial. So as a joke, we thought Neil Young, let's do Neil Young. Nobody <laughs> will be interested, but we'll get to play the music. And it was actually pretty successful. People came and uh, I was terrified because frankly, I don't sound very Canadian. <laughs> but um, didn't you say, and, you said to us it was a joke at first and then... It was, totally was a joke, yeah. It was. <laughs> we, when we, we played at the Arts Centre in Norwich and we sold the place out with the bar and they were, it was over, uh, you know, it was definitely in the fire limit, I mean. And um, <laughs> so, so it was great. It was, it was, and so, and, and you know, people are really nice about that. And uh, it's, it's a, such a great vibe and energy playing the Neil Young music, so... I wish we could explore all of this more. We are running out of time, so I, I quite like you to just tell us a bit about your last song because when you mentioned it before, it was fascinating. I think it's called "You Can Be a Friend." Yeah, um, he says looking at the wrong sheet here. Um, <laughs> here we go. What is it? What is it about this? 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 Well, it, it, it kind of says it. You can be a friend, and, and it's about looking at people in 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 society who maybe we do not want to be friends with and uh or we we don't you know we, we maybe feel kindly to them but um there's, there's a kind of um it's sort of bringing them in you know and bringing them into them and, and or, do you know what it's about seeing people to me it's this song is about seeing other people and and you said to us it was it was based on sort of an incident where you saw someone was rude to someone who's maybe vulnerable yeah um yeah, and was, i thought yeah. When you told us that, it was it was just amazing that you you sort of took a daily circumstance that you just saw, and you you created a discussion on it and and turned it into something powerful. Because there's nothing more powerful than song, is there really? No, <laughs> no, biased, no, so. no I don't think. So. No, yeah, well, I think we're all a bit biased about that. But yeah, yeah, no. <laughs> yeah. You, I, I actually put a few few examples of of, of that into this piece, um, sure. sort of, almost like a, like a list of of awful things. Okay, let's have a listen. <laughs> I didn't have much to live for That life had dealt him burns And plenty of little sharp things That don't make any difference now And everything he says Is accompanied by a smell That could really use some So he's handed around the room Like a debt to society They only wish they could Hand him on soon Well of course no one likes him When he sits there half pissed Reciting his half-baked poetry And they don't like to listen So they don't ever know That it was written when he used to understand He closes his eyes And falls back off the stool Into someone's property Who says, get off her, you fool but she's only made of plastic And she's going to wash clean And with a face so beautiful The price must have been obscene
in a hospital ward There's a man who doesn't make it easy to help He's long past worrying where his youth has gone But he wishes he could still feed himself Pride drains into the bed He beckons to a porter Who is in on the conspiracy To never give him anything Unless he says please He's gonna earn his next cup of tea Metamorphosis, it's disease and age It's a dirty book with a stuck-together page It's the girl in school eating her packed lunch alone Lacerated forearms, a dysfunctional homes And there's fear in their eyes And it's a fear on the wind Burning up hearts and it's burning up dreams, and you'll never be able to be loved again unless you hold their dirty hands and say you can be a friend. You can be a friend. You can be a friend. Thank you, Mark. Thank you so much for joining us and for showing us your songs that are obviously so personal and passionate to you. It's, it's really brave and emotionally revealing. And um, I honestly, I can't thank you enough. And I think that our audience as well, they're absolutely, they're relating to it. Based on the comments, I can see that they're loving it. Um, thank, you. thank you, George, for joining us as well. And thank you to thank Paul you for controlling it all behind the scenes. We couldn't do it without you. Um, sorry we ran so much over, but obviously we can't, we can't help it when we've got such great artists like this. We, we just have to keep talking. Um, we'll see you in a fortnight. Thank you very much for watching.